you to just think for a moment. Imagine if every dumb, outrageous, embarrassing and potentially illegal thing you'd ever done was captured permanently for the public record. In words and sometimes in pictures. Imagine if every journalist, partner, employer, police officer, teacher, political adversary, university administrator, public servant and anyone else with broadband, including your children or future children and grandchildren, had access to that information in the time it took to punch your name into a Google search for the rest of your life. I feel the need to pause briefly here to give you a moment to reflect on the true nightmare of the idea that as you mentally scroll through all your youthful indiscretions. Have I given you long enough to remember them all? I doubt it. Remember skinny dipping down the south coast on a school camping trip when it was minus a million degrees? That. Remember that less than legal amount of cannabis that you definitely did not inhale? <coughs> that. Remember that artistic body art that your university roommate asked you to lend a hand in the creation of? That. Remember the terribly embarrassing teenage love letters you sent to the absolute man or woman of your dreams, who you could never be apart from and thought that maybe, just maybe, you might even give up your virginity to. That. Oh dear. Fortunately, for most of us, the idiotic behaviour, and also just the youthfully exuberant behaviour of our school days and our university days and our early 20s, endures only in anecdotes told at reunions, or after a few drinks mostly. The stories were ripped out at 21st, 30th, and 40th birthdays. Perhaps the odd photo survived, but you scribbled out that evidence long ago. Memories. That's all you've got to worry about nowadays, and the only people who know the truth are those who you've long lost touch with, or who love you so much that they are either understanding or couldn't really care, or very good secret keepers. But what if they weren't just funny stories? What if all the dumb decisions we made back then lingered like a virus, infecting every aspect of our future? Welcome to the reality for children and teens, where everything they do online has the ability to seriously screw with their lives forever. Trying to teach kids about cause and effect can be a really tough gig, as any parent or educator knows, especially when the future means next weekend. Science has proven that the part of the human brain responsible for processing consequences doesn't fully develop until our early 20s. Combine this with the fact that most kids are spending vast chunks of their lives online, and most parents haven't a clue what they're doing there, and you have trouble, or the potential for it. If you ask the average adult what they need to protect their children from, they'll instantly say cyberbullying and pedophiles as their biggest concerns. But the more obvious threat to kids online? Themselves. Because we're not just talking about physical safety. There's also the potential to damage their reputation, sometimes irreparably. When President Obama spoke at a college graduation a few years ago, one student asked what she should do if she wanted to become president. President Obama replied, go home and erase your Facebook page. At a school speech not long after that event, he made the same plea to teenagers. Yes, that's right. Of all the messages the most powerful man in the world could deliver to a bunch of young minds desperate for advice, he chose to tell them, to beg them, to implore them, please, please, please be careful what you post online. Forever is a long time, but that's how long those photos and those words will last. Let's examine just one example. Let's look at sexting. In Australia, we currently have the most absurd legal situation when it comes to sexting, which is the act of sending sexual images, often consensual, via phone or email. Currently, under Commonwealth law, anyone under 18 who sends or receives a sexual image over the internet is guilty of child pornography offences, even if the image has been sent and received consensually even if the two parties are in a relationship, even if they're 17 and legally able to have sex with each other. Whatever the circumstances, the sender of the photo is guilty of producing and distributing child pornography, and the receiver is guilty of possessing it. This is how I found myself in a conversation with my teenager. If anyone ever sends you a picture of their boobs, delete it immediately. 
According to a recent report, two teenage sexters were recently charged and prosecuted with child pornography offences and placed on the sex offender registry in Victoria, branding them criminals and ruining their career prospects. Now, when you go on the sex offender register, there's no little asterisk that says, but it was my own penis, or she was my girlfriend and she said it was okay. Plainly, this is absurd. As academic Nina Funnell wrote recently, how can a person be charged for photographing their own body? And how can they be considered both the victim and the perpetrator of the same crime? This seems about as logical as charging a 15-year-old boy who masturbates with molestation of a child and ordering him to stay 500 metres away from his own genitals. Funnel goes on to note that child pornography laws were made to protect children, not to criminalise teenage sexuality. And she wonders, as I do, what good can come from grouping sexually curious teenagers in with convicted gang rapists and actual pedophiles. She says, not only does this ruin their lives unnecessarily, but it also undermines the power and authority of the sex offender register. We must preserve the integrity of this register by reserving it for individuals who pose an actual threat to society. Damn right we must. The sad reality is that the internet is moving and growing and expanding so damn fast that it is taking time for our laws to catch up. And even while our parliamentarians do seek to do their best and address these issues before they arise, we don't truly understand the application of how these new laws might work. Why? Because nobody's tested them. So many of the cases involving privacy in the online space never actually make it to a courtroom. They're settled behind closed doors for large sums of money, meaning that no legal precedent is set, no legal protection is created. The old-fashioned rules designed to keep us safe have not yet been picked up, examined and turned over by a judge who can make a ruling about how those rules apply to the online space today. And the people who stand to lose the most from this they're our kids. Someone needs to update where did I come from and they need to do it urgently. The world famous sex education book so many of us grew up reading wide-eyed has always lacked a few fundamental chapters like condoms are great, but now we need it even more. In a telling development, there's an emerging trend in the US to change your name by deed poll to erase the digital evidence of your past so you can start afresh in the workforce as a young adult. But obviously, it would be better to avoid the whole deed poll thing by protecting your online reputation from the start, yeah? Absolutely. And this is why I'm gobsmacked by the number of parents who choose to be ostriches instead of helping their kids to navigate the digital world. So many times I've heard parents say, oh, I'm not interested in Facebook and oh, Twitter, tweet, tweet, what, twits, aren't they just twits, ha, ha, ha. They say they don't want to start social networking. They say, oh, it's not, I just don't have time for that rubbish and who cares what people have for breakfast and why would you even spend your time, waste your time doing that? But Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Tumblr, Instagram, they are all absolutely things that parents need to be knowing about and caring about. Just imagine hearing another parent say, oh, I don't understand that road safety thing, all those seat belts and all the looking the left and the right, the right and the, what is it that just, you know, it's all too hard, whatever. Imagine saying that. And yet, or imagine saying, oh, you know those food groups? I just, you know, just, why, why can't everyone just have Cocoa Pops, you know, 24-7? I don't understand the things about the protein and the fat and the, I just eat whatever you like. And yet this is exactly the attitude that so many parents sprout about social media and it's negligent. It's a huge worry because there are certain online behaviours that can torpedo a child's future. On Mamma Mia, we receive countless, of, countless submissions each week, many from parents and also on our parenting website, ivillage.com.au. Many of them are recounting tales of their children's ventures into the online space and what has gone horribly wrong. Imagine horrors of teenage girls sending topless photos only having them used against them weeks later by other students. Imagine the school bully not just being able to give you a hard time in the playground, but being able to access you 24-7 access you through instant messenger, Facebook, Twitter and SMS. Imagine discovering a Tumblr that reveals your teenage son has been harming himself and exposing that pain to the world. Imagine thinking that you're safe 
to send um, an intimate picture of yourself to a partner via Snapchat, which is a texting service that only allows the image to appear on someone else's phone for a short amount of time, and then finding out that they'd taken a screenshot of it and sent it to all their friends. These are all genuine stories we've shared on Mamma Mia and on Our Village. They make your skin crawl. The reaction of some parents is to run away, to hide, to keep their kids offline. But the reality is that total refusal won't work, neither will being an ostrich, not forever. As parents, you know, we know that banning something outright is absolutely the easiest way to make sure your kid gets involved in it. We have to be smarter than that. And we have to recognise the phenomenal power of the internet for good and for our children, children's advancement and development, both socially and mentally. And yes, we need to be careful. For a long time, my son was busting to have his own Facebook page, my eldest son. For a long time, I refused. You're too young, I said. Facebook's for grown-ups, I said. Go, go climb a tree, I said. But then, around the time he turned 12, I waved the white flag. One day while I was updating my own Facebook page, he made his case yet again, and things took a different turn. All my friends are on it, he insisted, as he usually did, but instead of dismissing that as rubbish spin, as I usually did, I decided to call his bluff. Okay, come sit down and let's see exactly who you know is on Facebook. It turns out he wasn't bluffing. There were indeed a couple of dozen kids he knew with their own Facebook pages. We couldn't see much of their profiles because their privacy settings were all set to high, limiting what strangers could access. I was impressed by that and decided to set up a page for him, on the spot, together. He was a bit startled. Really? He exclaimed. You're really going to let me? Remember that gulp that we did early, thinking about all the things that were online? That again. In the months since that day, Facebook has exploded among teens and tweens as they discover the benefits of social networking in their tens, and tens of thousands. Whether you like it or not, hanging out virtually on Facebook and on Instagram has replaced hanging out in the, real, hanging out in the street like we used to do, and it's pointless to fight it. It can be fraught, but it's still possible to manage if you're smart. And if you're a parent or a child educator in 2013, you have to be smart. I have eight rules for parents when it comes to um, Facebook, setting up a Facebook account for their, for their child or for, for their child's use of Facebook. I don't pretend to be any kind of expert, but I'm a parent and I'm, a friends with other pa and I'm friends with other parents and I'm someone who works online. This is the best I've come up with so far. Number one, don't be an ostrich. There are so many things we have to teach our kids about in order to equip them with vital life skills and keep them safe and, safe and healthy, as I mentioned before. Nutrition is one, road safety is another, and technology is another. Remember, you can't make the rules if you don't understand the game. Don't panic, you don't have to be on Facebook and Twitter yourself, but you do need to know the basics of these sites so you can understand and decide, same with Instagram, what's appropriate for your kids. Because I understand how Facebook works, I know its potential weak spots for my kids and at what ages they should be on. Number two, set up your child's page together. By doing this with my, my son, I was able to set the privacy settings. This is crucial. You want to make sure your child's page is only visible to their friends. Same with photos, etc. It's also a good time to discuss what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to write in status updates or comments. This will depend on your personal views, of course. For us, we have a van on any personal details, including, including school, suburb where we live, things like swearing, and family photos that include any pictures of mum in a swimsuit. <laughs> Number three, put it in writing. You will never have as much power as you do when your child really, really wants something and you're deciding whether or not to let him have it. When our son wanted his own computer, I printed out a contract which he had to sign. It included clauses about us always having his password, limiting, in, limiting internet uses to public rooms of the house, and stating our parental right to confiscate it or limit its use without warning, or if our computers break down. <laughs> so far, so good. You may want to consider doing the same thing for Facebook or other social media sites. Number four, it's not called snooping, it's called monitoring. Thanks to social networking sites, you can see exactly how kids speak to each other and what they're interested in. If this sounds a little like snooping, it's because it is. 
or as I prefer to call it, monitoring or supervising. Facebook is the ultimate window into their world, especially during those years where, you, where communicating with them can be difficult because they don't want to tell you anything. Of course, to access this window, you need the password, which leads me to my next point. Number five, you need to know the password. The best time to get your child to agree to this is when you are first giving them permission to go on Facebook. Use that negotiating advantage. When you set up a Facebook page with your child, make sure yours is the notifying address for emails. That way, if your child tries to sneak, sorry, that way when your child tries to sneakily change their password, you'll know about it because you'll be informed. Can I suggest that once, if, once your child is on, you make it a condition, particularly when they're young, good luck when they're teenagers, I've been completely blocked by my son, but when they're younger, I got blocked because of my behaviour on Facebook. <laughs> So I broke some fragrant, fragrant, flagrant rules. I broke them flagrantly. And they were rules that my son set out for me, which is be quiet. Don't interact with me. Don't like any of my posts. Don't leave comments. So one time, after too many times, I got banned. <laughs> he was at the age where I felt comfortable that he could handle it himself. So I accept my banning, I won't say with good grace, but I accepted it. And I was like, but I was just saying that I like it when you said that you got a goal and I was just trying to be supportive and proud. Mortifying. So the best way to, to snoop is if they don't know that you're there. So stay very quiet. Um, number six, they must ask before uploading photos. We also have, a, have rules about uploading photos. You probably don't want holiday snaps of, of yourself in cozies on the internet. Um, and also younger siblings, that can be an issue. I've seen kids pick um, put up pictures without sort of thinking it through with maybe a younger sibling in the nude, in the background. Um, maybe that's just my house. Uh, there's often little nude people running around and you don't want that online and, and a, an older child won't think that through. Um, not to mention the fact kids don't really understand this idea that you lose control of images once they're posted online. You know, it's funny, you think back to, I don't know if anyone in this room is old enough, to remember the Australia card and when there was this outrage at the thought that there would be a card that would have some personal information about us that would be out there. I think all it would have was like our name and maybe our Medicare number or something. And, you know, it's, it's hilarious when you compare that to the information that people are falling over themselves to put online about themselves today, personal information. Number seven, there's only two more. They must ask before adding friends. My son not anymore, but when he was younger, had to ask my permission before adding friends. This is a really brilliant way to keep track of who they're communicating with online. To keep it age appropriate, be particularly careful about letting your child add the older siblings of their friends. Even a couple of years can make a huge difference to the things your child will be exposed to on Facebook, which segues into my last point, which is no adult friends. Now, this is the most important rule, and it's one that most parents miss. My child is not allowed to be, well, wasn't allowed to be friends with any adults at all. And it's an easy trap because there are plenty of adults in your child's life, godparents and cousins and family friends, who are perfectly safe and responsible. However, it's a little bit like saying, and this is the same with, with the older siblings of, of friends, um, if those older siblings or those adults, you know, those young adults, maybe older cousins, had a party would you allow your 10-year-old or 12-year-old to attend that party if it was unsupervised? So you think about the kinds of things that they'll be exposed to by being friends with adults um, and older kids, and that's something that you might want to really be careful with. So look, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm in the process of actually writing um, an e-book for parents about how to handle the online world. Instagram seems to be something that, that parents are massively concerned about at the moment. I keep hearing awful things um, from uh, my friends, particularly who've got girls around the tween age, um, and that's a territory I'm going to be heading into soon with my daughter. So um, it is really hard, it is really challenging, but, uh, you know, the internet can be a really scary place for kids, but as parents it's our jobs, and as, and as people who work with kids, it's our jobs to keep, job to keep them safe in the online world, not disconnected from it. We are raising a generation who will be personified by their connectedness. There's no point in sticking our heads in the sand. We need to hold their hands as we share with them the amazing possibilities, the boundless potential, the infinite knowledge that is at their fingertips, thanks to the internet. We need to show them that it can be a source for good, 
not that it's just a big, bad, scary place that only adults should go. And while social networking sites might not be your cup of tea, they're definitely your teenagers and your tweens. And if they're online, we should be too. Thank you. Thank you.